good evening, everybody. Uh, I think the drone has landed. Didn't discover any undesirable terrorists in the audience. <laughs> We're all safe. All right, so uh, welcome to the, uh, the evening event that we've been sort of secretively advertising. And uh, it, it's had all sorts of names. You know, maybe we'll have a little contest afterwards to, to see what name we actually should give this evening. But the idea, the basic idea you, you, you get, that basic idea is, you know, we, we all know 2020 was a watershed year. Uh, we, we know that neo-Marxism is a serious challenge. And the question is, you know, are we, are we up to meeting it? We know that we're going to have to build an alliance to meet it. And there's this question that is just in the air. You know, I think a lot of us avoid it a lot of the time. The question is, there's anti-Marxist liberals, good people. There's national conservatives tend in the direction of religion. And is it possible to, you know, to, to do more than just kind of an ad hoc alliance of sometimes helping each other? Is it possible to come together in a, you know, an actual alliance? Is, is there a replacement for, you know, 1960s fusionist conservatism that allows us to be together? Now, we're, the people on the stage, you know, we all know each other and uh, we're friendly, we're friends. But uh, the political issues, uh, you know, the things that, that deeply, deeply divide us. And we want to talk a little bit and see, uh, you know, maybe we can come together more than we thought. Dave, is that fair, fair description? You've set me up. I should say first that, as you can see, we all have an alcoholic beverage <laughs> next to us. Because you were all drinking before this, so why shouldn't we be able to? That, that seemed right. Uh, but if you're going to talk religion and politics, it seems best to do over a drink. Uh, I'm going with tequila. I feel like we should each announce what we are drinking. That might, that might offer a little insight into our political machinations. So I have tequila. You're okay, well, I asked for for scotch neat, and I got this full glass with this big lump of ice. So I'm not sure what I've got. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm doing a uh, massive lager, which somehow seems appropriate for my position on it. <laughs> and I asked for the largest possible scotch, which I was hoping would come like that, but it's come like this. <laughs> disappointment. So I guess, uh, I guess before we start, beyond the drinks, um, you know, one of, when we were trying to piece this thing together, what we were going to talk about and some of the stuff we agree on and, and disagree on, I should tell you all, it, it should, should just be known right up top, that we all were sort of like, whatever you want to do. We kind of all said that to each other, that really there's nothing off limits here. We are going to go for about 40 minutes, just the four of us, and then it'll be about a half hour Q&A after. And I hope that you guys will bring the best possible questions. You do not have to agree with any of us, except for me. That's why we have the drone. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and we look forward to, to a healthy discussion. So OK, and there, th th there's one mic. I won't, I won't bore you with the details. But for some reason, there's one mic over there for questions. So people, when we get to the question part of it, you know, if you can politely line up and, you know, not, not shove or do other, you know, antisocial things while you're in line, then you can ask questions. That was the most conservative conference thing I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> Very serious stuff. No, later people were going to say it was like this authoritarian moment. They got to see my I'm used to going to libertarian events. They just <laughs> bum rush the stage, you know? A... Okay, so let's, so, uh, so let's get started. Uh, start with something. Uh, very basic that we've been, you know, we've been talking about at this conference for, for, for a couple of days at this point, but it's been, it's been a big subject of discussion for years. And that, that is, um, you know, regardless of how people view the history, there's different ways of interpreting it, but people understand that after World War II, um, there's, there's this big push by Americans and Europeans to try to fix things, you know, so that there's not going to be a repeat of World War I or World War II. And, uh, and what they came up with was what, you know, today we call, we call it liberalism, but basically it's a, you know, it's a, it, it's a political theory. We can argue about, you know, its history, but, but everybody, I think, kind of agrees. After World War II, people said, look, you know, Jim Crow and all, all sorts of other things that, 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 that were, you know, nasty things coming in from the past. Liberals said, we're going to build, we're going to rebuild America, we're going to rebuild Europe. 
on a foundation of individual liberties and individual rights, right, which is a, a very ambitious and noble idea. But today, an awful lot of people think that you know we that 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 liberalism it you know it, it pushed uh, Bible out of the schools, it pushed prayer out of the schools. An awful lot of people think now, you know, it's two three generations later that uh, well you know maybe liberalism by itself just you know couldn't sustain itself. I wanted to kick off by asking, you know, what, what do you think about this? Is uh, liberalism by itself, the idea of, you know, life, liberty, and property, is that sustainable? You want to start? So, sure. Um, no, I think the answer is no. Um, yesterday, Dave, uh, in his astute remarks made more or less the same points where he said um, we've found on the far end of uh, that experiment that Yoram just outlined that um, that freedom without ends um, is not enough and in fact the way I would put it is that freedom without ends or limits a, a, an, a, an account of what it means to be happy and what, it, what, what freedom is really for and there are true or false or better or worse answers to that, actually leads to unfreedom. And I'll give you a couple of examples of this. One from the realm of um, um, culture and sexuality, and one from the realm of the economy. These are ones that I've worked on with, uh, I've explored in my most recent book, The Unbroken Thread. So to start with a kind of sexual and, and cultural one, it's obviously gender ideology, right? So the promise of of liberalism with respect to sex and gender is that um, I, as an individual, can conquer through sheer will and technological advancement what it means to be truly human so that I'm no longer bound by what nature tells me about who I am as a, as a, as a creature who is a male or female. I will impose that and I will overcome it. The problem is that for that promise of autonomy, pure autonomy to be instantiated, it's not enough that I be allowed to do that. I need you, Yoram, to acknowledge me as now no longer Sora, but let's say Sabrina. And you have to say I'm Sabrina. You Listen, I'll do that for you. <laughs> I mean, this conference has been a testament to your generosity, but as a social problem, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> that this would be an issue, right? So now we are, we are all forced to mouth absurdities that we know aren't true. On the economic realm, which is a huge component of this kind of liberalism, is, um, you know, again, f freedom for large employers to do anything they want, right? Or large corporations to do whatever they want. And it was sold as, again, liberation choice. Um, you, could, you could now open a, a, a shop on, on the Sabbath, and that's freedom, right? contrary to the Sabbatarian tradition that we've had both in Europe and the United States for many centuries. In practice, it just means that Jeff Bezos gets to um, tell his workers to com maintain completely unpredictable schedules. And the rest of us who work in, the blue, uh, in white collar professions are slaves to our smartphones. So in both cases, um, the, the liberalism's promise of liberation cashed out in the form of a deeper unfreedom. Um, let me make a couple of observations, a um, couple of dissents. Um, firstly, I'm just wild, I've got to flag this up. I mean, when you use the word liberalism, you're using the most shape-shifting term in the political lexicon. And it's very hard to have a discussion about liberalism without acknowledging that. I mean, this is, these are, this is a term which means different things. When you move a few miles across a border, um, it means something in one decade that it didn't mean in the previous decade. When Americans talk about liberalism now, they mean leftism. There's a fine tradition of political liberalism in my own country, which most people here would recognize as a conservative tradition. So when you say, is, is, is liberalism enough, you've just got to say, well, which liberalism? Which one are you talking about? Um, secondly, um, on the issue of religion, I should just make one point, Joram, which is that it's not, it's not state rules that have eroded religiosity in a country like America. It's facts. It's things that have happened in the realm of ideas, in the realm of science, in the realm of discovery, 
that have eroded the place of religion in our societies. Now, you may lament that, as Sohrab does, or you may praise it and be glad of it, like Richard Dawkins does. But that's simply an observable fact. You could legislate that the shops were, open, were not allowed to be open on Sundays. It would not affect the religiosity or the belief of the American public. So mu much of this is about catching up with philosophical and religious realities that have simply happened. And if you don't confront that, you can't confront any of what comes after. I'd say one other thing in relation to freedom. Uh, many years ago when I was starting off, John S. Sullivan, who's here, hosted me at the Hudson Institute, I remember, for a talk, and somebody asked me a question, and I was a bit rookie, and uh, I answered uh, at some point by saying, well, the answer is freedom. And we had a dinner afterwards, which John kindly put together, a very memorable evening with Irving Crystal and various others, including the late Robert Bork. And I remember um, Robert Bork, those of you who knew him will recognize the tone in which he said this. He said, you disappointed me tonight, Douglas. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> You don't want Robert Bork to say that. <laughs> and I said, well, well, how in particular? He said, it was just one thing. When you said that the answer was freedom, he said, freedom is not an unalloyed good. And you talked about it as if it was. And this is a very important point, and I've never forgotten it since, not just because of who it came from. But it's a very important point. Freedom on its own is not sufficient. Freedom on its own uh, leaves a whole set of other questions unanswered, and we're fools in our society to pretend otherwise, and the examples that Sohrab gave are examples of that. I don't see this, by the way, as failures of liberalism. I see this as failures of guts in the American public and in American legislature. I see it as a failure of guts in ordinary, reasonable people in all of our countries, including my own. Uh, when somebody says to me, well, let me put it this way around. When the gay rights movement uh, succeeded, in its quest in countries like this one. It did so by saying, gay people exist and you've got to accept it. It did not say, and therefore men and women do not exist. The problem with the trans movement is that it says, I'm here, I'm trans, and therefore you've got to change your language and change your understanding of biology. And the answer to that is no. I will be polite, as polite as I can be, but I will not change my understanding of reality. But that's simply a failure of uh, cojones, as some people might say. <laughs> It's, it's not a failure of liberalism. That joke really worked, considering you were talking about trans people. Um, <laughs> I liked to think it just... <laughs> I could sense you were very satisfied at the end. Well, look, well, go ahead. Well, I'll pick, up, I'll pick up on something that Douglas started with quickly, which is sort of the difference between leftism and liberalism, because, you know, I'm sort of the why I left the left guy, and I, you know, wrote a book defending classical liberalism, but in the last chapter, I was left with this issue that you're talking about. Is liberalism on its own enough? And, you know, briefly, I, I know we have a pretty politically astute crowd, so I don't think I have to do the full dissection of leftism versus liberalism, but years ago when I was a progressive and I was a Bernie supporter and all that, um, I started saying, you know, guys, we're, we're shouting everybody down, we're silencing people, we're deplatforming people, all of these things that actually were the most illiberal ideas, and yet they were coming from the people that were called liberals. So I've found myself in the last, say, two years, sort of at first defending liberalism constantly, and no, these people are illiberal, and where now I find it sort of exhausting, to Douglas's point, that the definition is so confusing, really almost, it's not just national borders, almost state borders at this point, uh, here in America at least, that for me to walk around really saying I'm a liberal in an American sense in 2021 doesn't really make sense. I'm, I'm more, I would say, of a liberal in the, in the original the, the classical definition of it, uh, which doesn't really work here. But I would say that, you know, when I was, when I was writing my book, which, as I said, was a, 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 def, a defense of classical liberalism, uh, I was also on tour with Jordan Peterson. And uh, the two things that Jordan constantly would hit upon, we did about 120 shows in a year and a half, and he gave a different lecture every night, which you guys know, like, that's basically impossible for anyone to do. It was really extraordinary. Every night, he would, he would take his intellectual pursuit to the end, and then he'd say, and I'll continue this tomorrow night, and then we would just happen to be in a different city tomorrow <laughs> night. So it was, it was really wonderful to watch and be there firsthand for that. But the two things that he always hit, and the two themes throughout the tour, and I think the things that made him so who he was and who he is, 
is that he talked about individual rights as, as the basis for Western society, that the individual is above the state. And then he also talked about belief. And I thought that was really interesting because at the beginning I, I wasn't on board the second part of that. I really was on board the individual rights part, of course, and that uh, you know it all starts with us. It starts with you as the individual, and I don't believe in some sort of top-down system. But he would blend that into something much bigger about belief and the importance of belief, and that many of us are believers even if we don't believe that we are. We are secretly or unconsciously believing something. And I, and I have come to believe that, for lack of a better term, that, that liberalism, for all of the goodness and the richness of the, of the tradition and individual rights and logic and reason and even laissez-faire economics and all of these things that were born out of classical liberalism, that there is an uncomfortable ending to it, which I would say, for example, uh, and then I'll move on, is uh, just this past weekend, I, I saw a clip of Bill Maher on Friday night, Bill Maher, who's been the standard bearer, really, in America of liberalism for these last 30 years. And in many ways, he's supported all of the, the people and ideas that are now coming to destroy the country. Uh, so he was talking about how you know mask mandates are, are, should be over. And he, I don't think he specifically addressed vaccine mandates, which I view as much more dangerous. But in essence, I was watching it thinking, well, you voted for all of these people. You, you ran around screaming that my conservative friends up here were racists and bigots and backwards religious zealots. And as much as I respect him in so many ways, I thought this is the missing piece for many of my liberal friends right now, is that you're not connecting your ideas to something eternal, something that is just bigger than us, whether you like it or not, and whether it has something to do with your intellect or not. And, which I do think it does, actually. Um, and that's left me in, a, in a, I would say, an interesting position that I, that I wasn't in a couple years ago. Can I just make one observation on that? Um, because we're mainly conservatives in this room, or at least almost overwhelmingly, and welcome to anyone who isn't. But um, it's, it's worth not just, let's, let's not just point out what, I mean, we can probably all agree that the left have been terrible cowards about their own side, undoubtedly. But there might also be a, a, something fruitful in saying, what is it about us that means they don't want to join? That would be a useful discussion to have in such a crowd. Because there may well be something, this was not the case in previous decades. I just mentioned Irving Crystal earlier. Irving and Norman Podhoretz and others of that generation in the 50s and so on were on the left. They were Marxists, much more left-wing than some people now in many regards. But they moved to the right and they said, I'm now on the right. Now, it may simply be a failure of bravery on the current American political left that they say, gosh, I've understood the dangers of the political position I hold, but then why don't they make the move? We could only blame them, but there might be a self-critique that might be worth having as well. What is it that we do that makes them stay away? What makes it so hard for them to make this leap? Well, I'd like to propose, propose something. Look, mm. I, I, I definitely don't want to get into a semantical tangle about you know, uh, what does and doesn't liberalism mean. But I think that we can talk about a, uh, a shift in uh, public mores and public philosophy of the kind that says, uh, look, for many centuries, uh, pornography was a violation of decency and obscenity laws, but now we have individual liberty and it trumps it. Your, your, your right to do these things, to buy these things, to, to perform these things, the, that, that right trumps the, the, the traditional concern for public decency. And I, I think you could come up with, with many other examples. The point is that, that the shift uh, in, uh, in American public philosophy, which, which is then echoed in almost everywhere in the democratic world, is a shift from saying there's such a thing as, as a public interest as a, uh, or a national interest or a common good. These are all to, a general welfare. All of these are terms that were used in order to hand down traditional norms of, of, uh, uh, of what was expected of people living in society. Now those traditional norms, um, have been, I, I think, have been uh, attacked and overthrown for two or three generations consecutively. And some of, some of those attacks, uh, I, I would and do applaud. I mean, just to, to, to pick the most obvious example, uh, the, the, uh, 
the, the, the oppression of, of uh, blacks in the American South on the basis of skin color, a, a, a crying injustice which, which did need to be repaired. And the tool that they used it was individual liberty and individual equality. But at this point, to me it seems that there's been a progressive dismantling of any kind of inherited guardrail or public norm. And the, the result is not, you know, what we used to think liberalism was, was you know, just a, a general people being nice to one another and accommodating and not, you know, not hurting the other. The, the result is that a, a, a young person today grows up in complete confusion. I'm talking about my own children, they grew up in an Orthodox community and they too are affected by it. They, they find it difficult to, to marry. I'm not talking about the rebels, I'm talking about the loyalists, the ones who, who you know, they want to do everything, they find it difficult to marry, they find it difficult to have children, they find it difficult to stay married, they find it difficult to do military service, they, they, they find it difficult to keep the Sabbath. It, everything is difficult for them, and I'm talking about the ones who want, who want to, to uphold the traditions. And to me it seems that this is, and, and here I'll mention uh, Jordan Peterson as well. To, to, to me, it seems th th this is anomie. This is uh, um, what, what, what Durkheim described as what happens when a society no longer has norms that allow people to use their common sense in order to guide themselves towards things that are better in terms of what the society wants. Society says to them, look, you make all the decisions. You're 18, make all the decisions. You're 15, make all, you're 10, you're four, make all the decisions. You can, you can choose your own, you can do whatever you want. And when, when that's reality, the social reality, I mean, then someone like me or Sorab or any of our colleagues, you know, on the, on the more traditionalist side, we come and say, look, we, we don't need to persecute people who dissent or are in the minority. But there have to be public norms. And if there aren't public norms, mm. then, then, you, uh, then, then what you've opened yourself up to is you know, a, a, any kind of tyranny. Why do people not want to join us? Why do they think I'm scary? I don't think I'm scary. Do I, am I, do I look scary? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, don't, I just don't think I look scary. But, but people obviously think I'm scary. I get written up in the Washington Post, you know, among these li lists of, you know, the, the worst, you know, political monsters in history. Don't worry, the and Washington Post criticized me for lamenting Notre Dame burning down. <laughs> okay, so we all look, we they, all look They said it was an alt-right meme to care about Notre Dame burning down, so. Right. That's okay. all I have to say may, about may the Washington I, Post. I, yeah. So, so you, ask, you ask why do we look scary? I'm, uh, uh, here's my proposal. We look scary because we're saying we want to establish public norms that, that the majority can live with and which will be uh, uh, used in order to encourage, to, to, to encourage young people, this is the way to go. You'll be applauded if you go this direction. And people say, that sounds like tyranny. I don't want to be with, with the tyrants. I think that's it. Let me make uh, two observations. One is, if the past few years have taught us anything, um, uh, is that Urim is scary. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> if, they, if they've taught us anything, is that the, again, I, I, I'm not, I, I have to, here I have to disagree with, with Douglas that liberalism is so indeterminate a term that you couldn't generally draw some um, conclusions about it. One of, one of liberalism's claims is that, generally speaking, um, it's a non-coercive society. In, in other words, a society in which um, in, in no kind of moral claims are coercively, authoritatively enforced against the individual. And if the past few years have taught us anything, is that that's, that's an illusion, right? That's part of, that is part of liberal ideology's claims for itself. And that when it actually becomes dominant in a society, it absolutely has a substantive vision which will, it, it will coercively enforce against you. So that supposedly non-coercive liberal societies are shot through with coercion. It's just that they're not typically enforced or imposed, or not only imposed by the state, 
often they're imposed by private actors like large corporations and big tech and academe and so forth. So it's useful for us, even for, let's say, liberals like, like Douglas and, and Dave, who see some value in the liberal tradition, to be honest about what liberalism in practice is like and to, 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 to lose this illusion of a non-coercive society. Every society uh, uh, coerces. The other one, and this is a more philosophical point to your uh, observation, um, Yoram, is that the real distinction, I think, what you're hitting on with young people who have no sense of what, what should I do? Should I marry? I'm dating this girl, it's been 10 years. Should I, <laughs> should I, should I like commit to her? Should we have should children? Take, take the what, plunge. What does it mean to, 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 for me to fulfill myself as a, as a man, as a human being? Um, is that, that, again, liberal ideology, not individual liberals, but liberal ideology tries to say that there's no distinction from, for freedom for the good versus freedom for evil. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, when he first came to the West, um, was asked to come give a speech at Harvard, and everyone expected him to talk about the evils of the Soviet Union. Oh, and oh boy, he knew about the evils of the Soviet Union having, having lived through the gulag. Nevertheless, the speech that he actually de delivered was a critique of the West, and specifically of its loss of its sense for what he called freedom for good versus for freedom for evil. And he had seen this in his own life as a newcomer to the West, that um, you know, people tried to take advantage of him, often legally. The culture was degraded, often legally. It wasn't a, you know, the law allowed this, this degradation and made no distinction between genuine acts of freedom, which in the classical tradition, again, the tradition stretching from, from Aristotle to St. Thomas Aquinas, the classical and Christian tradition always distinguish between freedom for what you ought to do as a human being and freedom what you ought for we ought not to do. So that when we say, for example, you mentioned this young person, hypothetically, um, who, who, is, who is, is a society in which he carries a digital bro brothel in his pocket, um, and in liberal society enables that, uh, you say, okay, well, it's a free act, but instantly he's, he's addicted to pornography, it rewires his brain, it re rewires how he relates to like, actual living women. Is he really free? Is the opioid addict? Is, the, is it, all the sort of legalization, deregulation that's happened, has it created, made us really free human beings if freedom, again, as the classical non-liberal tradition holds, if freedom is freedom for the good, I would say the answer is no. And if there is a coalition to be forged between traditionalists and liberals, classical liberals, conservative liberals who want to move on, it has to be based on these kind of philosophical recognitions about the nature of liberalism. First of all, I, I didn't say that you could not define liberalism. I said it's a shapeshifter and it means different things in different places, and these are two different things. I'm not saying it's such an obscure idea that we can never pin it down. I said we can pin it down, but we must be precise in doing so in different places. Secondly, on the nature of the coercive state, and nobody would deny that there is a form of coercive liberalism which occurs particularly in modern America, but all dominant systems practice coercion of some kind. Yes. That's a human thing. Yes. That is a human thing. And as for the person struggling that you mentioned, Yoram, I don't by any means dismiss this. But when was sex easy for the young? When did relations between, when, when was the dream moment when this did not cause endless turmoil to young people? And, and how are you going to change the things that have happened that I would say you have to accept which are unchangeable? What is the thing that most changed sexual relations in the 20th century? It's not pornography, it's not any of that, it's the pill. It's the pill. That's the reversible. pill changes absolutely everything. And if, if one doesn't acknowledge that that change is there for, there for anyone who wants it, and it's going to remain like that, you, you, you can't persuade people. I'd add one other thing on this, which is, in my view, and this is a, a British liberal view, there is nothing so ridiculous as one male adult telling another male adult what to do with their genitalia. Nothing more ridiculous. You can tell people what, you, what your own principles are, but it is the most ridiculous thing for an adult to tell another adult how to organize themselves in this area. You mentioned children. That is a totally different realm. The realm of children that you mentioned is the realm of parenting. It's the realm of parents and the role of parents to ensure that their children 
have respect for other people, have respectful relations with other people, but once they're adults, what else are you going to do? And I just add one thing onto that, on furthers the point I made about the pill. There's a very fine poem by Philip Larkin, some of you may know, called High Windows, which takes a very, very unusual, Philip Larkin is generally regarded as a very conservative poet, but it takes a highly unusual attitude towards the pill. He, he talks about it, he says, seeing a young couple on a train and knowing that she might be on the pill or he's using a contraceptive, he says, they, I realize these people had something I dreamed of all my life. It's a totally counterintuitive thought because most people think, like uh, the famous example is Malcolm Muggeridge, who, as my friend Clive James used to say, one noticed that Malcolm turned against vices at the precise moment that he became incapable of them. Um, it, it, what tends to happen is that the old lament things that are available to the young, partly because they feel some kind of bitterness that they weren't available to them. But there were things that happened in the last century that were profound advances. Now, they aren't unalloyed goods, but nor was what happened before them unalloyed good. If I could just further Douglas's point there, uh, I think we've seen just literally in the last two weeks how the parent-child part of this is a really key piece to all of this because the liberals, leftists, whatever you want to call them, the Democrats have willingly gone on with all of the critical race theory stuff, have gone on with the mask mandates and the vaccine mandates. And then finally, in the last two weeks, sort of relative to this gubernatorial race in Virginia, when it really started coming out the way critical race theory was being pushed and the way Terry McAuliffe was, was pushing it, when it came out that Merrick Garland was issuing this, this edict in effect that you know, parents that went to school board meetings were, were domestic terrorists, there finally were parents saying, oh, maybe something really is wrong here. So I think, I think that point is well taken, that maybe a lot of liberals let a lot of stuff slide and then finally, when it moved on to their children, they've now begun to wake up. So that does give me some hope. I would also say, to the point about maybe is there something we've done wrong here that, that sort of stops them from coming roughly around to whatever it is that we're agreeing on here. Uh, you know, as somebody that wasn't part of this just a couple of years ago, the, the culture piece cannot be overstated. The, the, the general sort of what you get from television and from movies and all of that stuff that Republicans and conservatives are somehow just bad people. They care about money, they care about war, they don't like women or black people or minorities, they hate immigrants. Like that stuff, which sounds so cliche and ridiculous to you guys here, obviously, it really seeps in to young people, it really seeps in. And I know it because I'm only 45 and it seeped into me. So it wasn't that long ago. It was only you know, 25 years ago that I was in college. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not that long ago. And I think that piece maybe has to be dealt with in some ways before uh, figuring out exactly the idea part of this. Because if, and, and by the way, I think it's happening. You know, I think the internet has flipped a lot of things on its head. It's like the meme culture and the fun culture online is now something that's more from the right than from the left. They've become more hysterical. You've seen what they've done to late night comedy. When's the last time you heard new music or anything sort of creative or artistic coming out of the left? So they've become the authoritarians that they were always railing against. I always think the best example of this is Ben and Jerry who uh, you know, were, were 60s hippie socialists who sold their company to Unilever for 350 million and they still pretend that they're socialists. I think we've seen sort of an end of that thing. So I think we have to figure out the culture part, which is sort of where I've been focused, almost in a way before we, we get to the exact answer on this question. You know, I, 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 I agree with most of what you're saying, but I, st I, I, I feel like we're, I, I feel like we're, we're missing, missing something important. I, look, I, w with regard to the pill, nobody can disagree that the pill had a big impact. But just for the record, the, the, the banning of the Bible in the United States and American schools throughout the country and the banning of prayer was not caused by the pill. It happened before the pill. And, and, the, and the, I mean, it's roughly the same time, but it's certainly not causal. And the, the, the same is true for, for the legalization of pornography and the ending of blue laws. And all, all of these ha things happened before the pill. I, I don't want to, look, the, the, the pill is a, is a weighty and important cause. I don't mean to disrespect it in any way, but, uh, but the revolt against public norms in the name of 
what was called, at least in America, was called liberalism. Uh, we can call it something else, individualism, uh, rights. That revolt has left a tremendous number of people feeling that they are under siege. And the reason they feel that they're under siege is because they don't believe that parents can raise their children alone. And I think that factually that's true. I, I've raised a few children. I think if factually it's true that parents who are part of a congregation, who are part of a larger society, that to some degree or another reinforces the things that they're teaching, they have, they, they, they have a hope of giving a compass to their children as as they understand, look, children are always rebellious. In any, every generation for thousands of years and nobody's gonna make children into automatons of their parents or anybody else. But still, the experience of parents raising children today is that decisions have been taken out of their hands because, because no one in the community can, can, can defend their children in a circumstance in which the pub, public culture is flooded without restriction, without end, with all sorts of things that they object to. Now, so I'm not saying, here's what I'm not saying. Certainly not saying that in a country filled, in, in, let's say in a state, in a country, in a place, in a town, filled with people who are, uh, who, who are 1960 styles liber liberals and they believe in that, I'm not saying that the goal is to you know, try to force them to study Bible. Okay, that, that, that's absurd, no, nobody's gonna be able to do that. But what about in places where there's still a majority of Christians who are trying to defend their, uh, the, the, their right to raise their children as Christians or as Orthodox Jews or as something else? But that's what happens. You have schools where they go. Uh, no, that's not what happens. What, what, that's what should happen. Uh, but, but it isn't it's what, what happens happen. in no, my no. country. You, get, you, get, you send your children to the school that you would like them to have. The, the but, but, it, but even in Britain, they, the uh, religious schools are increasingly subject to teaching LGBT ideology. Right? That's why Orthodox Jewish schools are often at odds with... Sure, the Orthodox Jewish schools are the ones that are resisting most. And Muslims in Birmingham. and Australia. Yeah, the Muslims resist rather more forcefully. And Poles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> look, look uh, England has three crosses. Britain has three crosses on the flag and, and an established church. So it's not exactly parallel. And I don't know exactly what the causation is. I don't know how much is America influencing Britain and the other... I, I, these are things I don't know. Mm. Here, here's what I think I do know. What I think that I, I do know is that if you want, you, 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 you are the, the majority in a conservative state in the United States, and you want to go back to requiring Bible and prayer in the schools as part of a, a way of shoring up, because the majority in the community believe in it, and, and, uh, uh, and, and you think that this is necessary because otherwise your, your children won't get the basic in education in, into their traditions, then this is, not, this is not legal, this is not possible. Even having a majority doesn't make it legal and possible. And here at this conservative gathering, you know, we, 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 I think the thing we need to be asking ourselves is, is if we're talking about the craziness and the lunacy, isn't it lunacy that a civilization based on the Bible in, in, in a state or a locality where the majority of the parents want their children to learn Bible, mm -hmm. it's illegal and you can't, the children can't learn Bible. And I, I think that the, the kind of compromise that we should be looking for is, is one in which majority cultures have the ability, have, 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 have the right to establish the public culture and minorities living in those places should have the, uh, the, the right to um, uh, to to uh, uh, well treatment. Well, 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 look, decent treatment, obviously. But I'm saying, uh, somebody. Let's say you're teaching Bible in, in uh, Bible in a school, and there's a Jewish kid, and it's on New Testament. And his parents don't want him to learn it, so he, does, he shouldn't have to learn it. You, you you don't have to force him. If his if his parents are atheists, then he can get an exemption to not be in Bible class. But to take the the uh, the minority you know, in a population of tens of millions and say that the minority has the, uh, the ability to stamp out the views of the majority in education and public life, that seems to me to be simply crazy. Well, I guess what the issue is really is what are those norms then and how are we gonna agree on those norms? I mean, there is a bit of a, a, an elephant in the room which is that two of the panelists here are gay. I'll let you guys figure out which two. Um, <laughs> so, so, 
you know, I'm almost hesitant to bring it up in an odd way because I don't want, I actually don't want to make it personal, but, but this is sort of floating here now, right? And that's good, so, so let's do this. I mean, those norms, if they're purely biblical norms, uh, and I don't, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, I don't think this is exactly what you're saying, but if they purely are, well then there's going to be some infringement on my ability to live a functioning life. I've been married for 11 years, I'm in a faithful relationship, we're working on having kids, I wanna live in the same country that you wanna live in, that all of you wanna live in, um, but depending on where you guys wanna draw those, those lines, we might have an issue. Can I give a concrete example? Yeah. Um, in today's Hungary, under Prime Minister Orban, um, there is absolutely no persecution of gay and lesbian Hungarians, right? There's, uh, there's a subculture that continues to exist. But it, the line is drawn precisely at the school, right? There's a new law that says, you know, LGBT ideology doesn't belong in classrooms, um, doesn't belong. I'm okay with that, by the way, and Douglas has probably written the best stuff on this, so. Totally, totally. And so I think um, that's an example of trying to instantiate what Yoram was talking about of, um, concrete norms. Uh, nevertheless, the, the, um, the minority in this case is, as I said, well treated and not excluded um, and not, not, not oppressed in any way. And I think if you're, if, if, if you're okay with that, that's, that's interesting. I will just say, again, that well, pure liberal philosophy wouldn't stop at the door of the school or in the, even the creche of the, of, the, of, the, of the parent because the idea is that each person should be absolutely autonomous to make his or her own way in the world to penetrate into the mystery of existence and therefore any inherited moral claims or obligations are always already at the very beginning suspect so that a former president of Ireland, for example, would say the Catholic Church should rethink baptism because the baby doesn't get to choose whether or not he or she wants to be baptized. Or many you know, would say the same thing about circumcision. Circumcision is inherently a kind of inherited um, claim and about, of, of, of peoplehood and of, of, of a religion over the baby. So if you leave it up to liberal ideology alone, it has no room for the thing that you, you for, for the parent, for the child. Now, uh, if, you're, if, if you're willing to reconsider that, I think that, that there can be a negotiation of, okay, well, you, uh, that's obviously wrong because that, that strikes us as wrong that a parent should have a child. Um, so it should have some say in how the child is raised or a political community should have some say in the, how a child is raised. And we can negotiate you know, you know, where, where XYZ minority fits into that. Can I just, sorry to return to the question of liberalism, but since it keeps being confettied around, we've got to do something with it. Um, John Gray in his essay, Modus Vivendi, is one of those, sort of in the tradition by Isaiah Berlin, who, who talks about two different versions of liberalism, which, we, which is convenient at least for a conversation like this. The first is, and he points out that, of course, there was always this problem within liberalism, which is, is it, an, is it the opportunity to set the, the optimal conditions for the society in which people can then pursue their own forms of happiness and, indeed, even freedom, or is it itself a sort of ongoing process? Now, as I see it, the liberalism we're probably all opposed to on this panel is that second version. Certainly, I'm opposed to that. I don't believe that the liberal project should be this endless endless acquisition of more and more rights or anything like that. I do believe that that former form of liberalism is an optimal one, or at least more optimal than any of, your, of the alternatives that have been provided. Because it seems to me, again, we go back to this issue of, as it were, who can set down the ground rules. Let, let me just return to a very important point in this. Like the Catholic Church lost its moral authority in country after country. That was not because of liberals, it was because of the Catholic Church, specifically the behavior of priests. You cannot lament the, I think, terrible alterations that are going on in a society like Ireland, which has become a rapaciously advancing second type of liberalism society. You can't lament that without recognizing that they've become this stupid society worshipping every imaginable newly arrived god because the priesthood let them down atrociously. 
That's why. And that's why, for the time being, not many people want to listen to the priesthood in Ireland, and now in France, and in other countries. Now, I lament this, by the way. I'm not a Catholic. I spent some years at a Catholic school, but I'm not a Catholic. But I lament the way in which this has happened with the church. But it is unavoidable, absolutely unavoidable. And let me add one other thing on this. The optimal conditions are, in my view, already in place for this dialectic. Um, I'm sure most of the panel know the, uh, the, uh, di the dialogues between uh, the then uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, and fa my favorite pope, and, uh, and uh, Jürgen Habermas, published in 2005. Um, and the Habermas-Ratzinger dialogues are very useful for lots of reasons, as you know. One of them is it shows, it shows the answer, and the answer is pretty clear between the secular and the religious. The answer, as Habermas and Ratzinger pretty much agree on, is that the church does not aim to be the political governance in the society. And the secular have something themselves that they have to accept, which is that church has thought deeply on issues of morality and social issues. This is a very important exchange. And by the way, I might, I'm very rarely regarded as a peacekeeper, but I once did a bit of peacekeeping myself in this regard between the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, and Richard Dawkins on this matter in a public debate. They pretty much agreed on this. I got pretty much agreement on the Ratzinger Habermas agreement. That's what it is. Now, why are, are some people on the left, to return to my uh, first point, possibly worried about joining the right? In part because they worry that when they're not looking, we're going to smuggle Catholic doctrine onto them. Or we're going to make the priesthood stand over them again. Or the Orthodox rabbis, or someone else. And they're worried about that. And maybe there is a worry there. So how do we, how do we take this worry away? One is to say, if you're a believer, you're a believer. And you should have the right to raise your children as believers as well, and then they can make their own choices in the world. And if you're a non-believer, you should at the very least respect the fact that this is a tradition of unparalleled richness, thought, philosophy, culture, thinking, and that you're not to merely deride it. That's the basis for some kind of agreement. Douglas, I, um, I do love that dialogue. I have to ask you, um, let me stipulate just for the sake of argument, I, I don't actually stipulate this, but just for the sake of argument that the Catholic Church and other religious authorities have lost their um, sway merely because of either process of secularization or their own corruption and so forth. Set that aside. How do you account for why the first type of liberalism that you celebrate seems everywhere to have devolved into the second type of liberalism. In other because words, people like, are selfish. Okay, well, I mean, the people have always been selfish, but you, not, exactly. you might say about any ideology, like why is it that its um, development over time always seems to go in one direction? There's a sort of telos or a, a, an inherent end to a certain ideology. And if that's the case, isn't it, uh, so how do you claw yourself back to the, original liberalism, and if it contained, as I think, and I think a lot of people think, can, if that original liberalism already contained the conditions for bringing us here, for example, the idea of limitless autonomy for the individual would some ways lead to wokeism. I'm not arguing for limitless autonomy, of course. But j just very quickly, uh, as regards to that, uh, it, it is, I'm afraid, these are all just manifestations of human behavior in different guises. Um, it, you wouldn't people, say that about communism, right? You would say if you saw communism ab apologized for in that sense, like, well... Well, look, I mean, let me put it this way. People are behaving let me badly this way. as communists. What do, the, what do the top ranks of the communist parties in every country always do? They become acquisitive. They acquire wealth. They tell the people they don't need it, but they take it for themselves. They become a totally cynical, corrupt, top hierarchy, lamentably misgoverning a people. The church always tends towards acquisitiveness on the behalf of the clergy, always. I adore the Vatican, but it's a t testament to this. Uh, it's the same with liberalism in the first form, as John Gray would outline it. People, it goes wrong because people want to acquire stuff. 
stupid, idiotic, rampaging liberal groups want power, just like the church wanted power, just like people always seek power. And in our own era, in a secular age, in a liberal age, you have rid ridiculous, in my view, liberal priesthoods who want power and they grab it. And you have unbelievably, lamentably low-grade gay groups who say, I've got a little bit of power here and I'm going to stretch it out as much as I can because my pension and my mortgage and my social prestige relies on it. To hell with those people. But it's case after case that you see these people. It's just a human ugliness which our own age recognizes in the priesthood, can recognize in the rabbinate when it happens, and is very slow in recognizing among the liberals. Well, we can speed up. Look, I agree, it's a human ugliness. What, but the, the question that I, I feel that I'm asking and I feel that, that, that perhaps you, you, you don't want to address directly, I don't know, is why should, since we agree on human ugliness, we agree on the multiplicity of priesthoods including in the new religions. We completely agree on this, we see the same thing. So why is it that regions that have large Christian majorities are not permitted to run a Christian public life with carve-outs for Jews, for gays. Well, you, uh, D D Dave's asking me, you know, like, like wh what would happen to the gays? It's a completely reasonable question. It's exactly the right question. But I want to begin with the Jews, all right? The, the Jews are a tiny minority everywhere, except in Israel, thank God, but the tiny minority everywhere. What is it about uh, the, the, the condition of Jews in a given country that, that, that makes it seem as though Jews being offended by a Christmas tree or a nativity scene or by the teaching of the New Testament in a school should then, if, if Jews were to press the point, lead to the banning of the teaching of the New Testament? I, I can't understand this. I mean, it's simply something that makes no sense to me. There's an overwhelming majority which is, is, has been relatively, compared to every, every place in history, has been good to the Jews. You know, in America, I'm talking about all, going all the, way, all, all the way back to the beginning. Even if you include every bit of anti-Semitism that there surely was, America was good to the Jews. So what, what brings it about that Jews, in order to live as Jews, to, to, to be, what do we need? We, need? we need to be able to, to create Talmud Torah, to be able to, to teach Torah to our children. That, that can't be illegal. We have to be uh, able to, to, uh, to do a, a brit milah, circumcision, kosher food. I mean, you can go on on. There's, there's the things that we need. One thing that we do not need is for the New Testament to not be taught in schools. Oh. Jews don't need that in order to be Jews. Okay, so, so, so I'm asking you, uh, look, I... I well, I, not, I, first off, I, I, I actually don't disagree with you. I have no problem with the Christmas tree being in a school. I remember in elementary school there was a Christmas tree. It was all right by me. Uh, I think this sort of gets to Saurabh's point about the difference between having, let's say, gay people in society that are trying to be functional, self-actualized members of society like everybody else versus what the LGB, and as Douglas put really well in his book, he separated the T from the community because this has now morphed into something else. Should that be taught in schools? I mean, I don't think so. I think you should be teaching about individual rights and some of the other things that we've taught you, discussed here. We should be taught, you know, you can teach about mutual respect and things of that nature. But I don't, I don't want those things taught in school. As a matter of fact, I mean, I know plenty of gay people that are horrified at what is coming out of the, the gay community now. I mean, truly horrified, because in many ways it's setting back a tremendous amount of progress. The, the progress of equality, the progress of, okay, you can enter the same contract that uh, a heterosexual couple can, and now you can hopefully live a life that, that, is, that is sustaining. You know, the, there, it's ironic because there's a huge conservative argument, I think, actually, for gay marriage. I, I lived in West Hollywood in, in LA. It's, it's sort of the gayest place on earth. I mean, the crosswalks are rainbow. It's too much, frankly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's nothing sadder to me than when you see, you know, this a, a 70 year old guy that's spray tanned and fake hair. It sounds like Trump, but that's not what I mean. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
you know, that works out all day and carries his little dog and, and has nothing to live for other than that and, and maybe being on the hunt still because he couldn't engage because 50 years ago the world was very hostile to him and couldn't then get in a relationship that would be the thing that conservatives would want even if it wasn't exactly the relationship that conservatives would want. So I don't want, I actually don't want those things taught. I think that, that Douglas could probably explain this a lot better. I mean, the, the T thing has completely uh, just dysregulated the entire conversation here. But I think in many cases, it's like we have to be able to separate when you're talking about that carve out, we have to have that carve out. I, and I would say I would be a little worried. I'm still a little, well, course, I'm still a little worried. Well, yeah. of, course, of course you're worried be, because, because what I'm asking you to do is to be, willing to consider, I mean, I'm talking about in, in a dialogue, in a negotiation, but to be willing to consider a, uh, something other than the, the maximal dream scenario. Yes, I fully accept in, that. In, they, order to, in, order to create, in order to give the Christian majority the, the possibility of running a Christian society in Christian areas. Right, that's, Not that, only do I accept that, I, would, I will be very clear, I would strongly prefer that public schools teach the Old Testament and the New Testament rather than drag queen story hour. So, I mean, I think, I think that's, <laughs> that's pretty, I mean, I, I literally mean that, but that's what I mean about the dysregulation on this. Uh, uh, Douglas, maybe you want to add on but, that? You know, um, Alan Bloom says in the closing of the American Mind that uh, if you're not going to have the Bible, you'd have to find a Bible-like book, and there aren't many. So, <laughs> so he sort of answers the question himself. But you know, one of his great influences, Leo Strauss, made a very important point about what Strauss calls the moderns, which I think applies to liberalism in the way I'm trying to explain it here. It's the nature of a, I'm, again, I'm trying to be careful about it, a liberal society in a form of a term that I would understand it is that the liberal society has to encompass not just everyone in this room which, and everyone on this stage, which is a hard enough task. It has to in, be able to encompass everyone in the room outside as well. And in the case of America, a bewildering array of people. That is different from a religious uh, um, predicament. Uh, a religious community can encompass only the people in it now. This causes a deep problem in the source of liberalism, which is this, and it's what Leo Strauss points out about the moderns, which is that liberalism in this form has to be as wide as possible to encompass the population and to allow people to carry on with the lives they would like to live within that population. Here's the downside of it. The foundations are shallow. The foundations are necessarily shallow when you're building a tent this wide. Now, other communities, Orthodox Judaism, the Catholic Church, and many other communities, have very, very deep foundations. But their remit is going to be narrow. So this is an advantage and a disadvantage. But for a political movement to return back to where we came in, it would be fatal to say that only one form of these religious ideas, or indeed one form of these political ideas, is enough. Since I was last in America, I've been horrified by the dissolution and disappearance of unanimity of any kind on the political right in this country. It hurts me so much when I hear people saying time and time again things like rhinos, the Republicans in name only, and everyone does it thinking they're so smart. If somebody votes Republican, that's pretty good, <laughs> just to begin with. Like, be grateful they did that, at least, you know? Give them some credit. But it's all about excommunication now on the political right. There are publications across the right in this country. They're all falling out. Everyone's falling out. Everyone's going into their own little community on the right. And it seems to me, I'm an observer, but I wish this country well, and I want the right in this country to do well. I want the Republicans to do well. It seems to me that that is a fatal thing for any movement, and that the answer has to be in being able to broaden out again, widen out again, and make people trust you that when they're not looking, you're not pulling some funny stuff. Douglas, uh, I, I'm, I'm moved by your appeal, I, but I don't understand the, uh, the move towards, and I, I hope I'm not misquoting you, the, the move towards there being a particular specific kind of 
religious uh, doctrine or decision made. In 1947, in this country, the first time that the, that the principle of separation of church and state was applied to the states rather than to the federal government, was applied to the states, it was in the city of Chicago, what was struck down by the National Supreme Court, by the federal Supreme Court, what was struck down was a program in Chicago schools called Release Time. Release Time allowed Catholic priests, Protestant ministers, and rabbis to offer classes in the, the, in the public school buildings um, during, during, uh, uh, during school hours. And the, the students were allowed to choose one of the three or to, uh, on the basis of conscience, to abstain from them. Th that was a program that existed in tens of states and it was struck down on, a, uh, uh, on the basis of the principle that it was forcing religion on those people who didn't want religion. Mm. And everything that's followed in the, in the de decades since 1947 follows this, this pattern. There was a, a, a famous angry dissent by William Rehnquist in the 1980s mm -hmm. arguing that this entire line of, of decisions was, was a, a fabrication that it had no historical basis and was in the American constitutional tradition and was certainly destructive to the country. And what I'm asking is why should, not we, why should we not and here I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about, uh, let, let's say, why should we, those of us who are in the room, in this conversation, why should we not say that such programs should be permitted of course in should, those no. states of course that they want should. them? Yeah, they should be permitted and they should be allowed for parents who want that for their children. Of course. Okay. So this means, if we were to do something like that, that there will surely be a minority who will be uncomfortable with it in every state in which it's implemented. There will be states in which they can't find a rabbi and the, and the Jewish students will be uncomfortable. There will, there will be students who are, are, are Hindus and they, they might feel uncomfortable. There are going to be people who feel uncomfortable. And I think the time has come for us conservatives conservatives and, and, and their allies, or cons however you want to describe the alliance that hopefully will go forward. It's, the time has come for us to say that the, that the public culture of Christianity has the right to contend through the democratic process and to negotiate with minorities. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and, and to express itself of course, it in, should argue itself. In every itself. way that is, that, that is not, a, that is not a, a, a blatant persecution, that is not a persecution should, of minorities. It should argue its place in the public sphere and be able to do so freely. Absolutely. Dave? I agree. I actually think we might have done a little healing there. That, that sounded pretty solid. I mean, I think we're, we're all I've got a feeling Sarab is going to give us a Yeah, <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> No. That sounded sort of like the right ending to this. this oh, no, okay, this is. Or, yeah, we need to go. To the, no, no, we, we, we have to. I'm going to disappoint those who uh, only see me as a pugilist. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to agree with the group on this one. You're good for Do we have time for questions? Wait, wait, just, just put glasses here. So, uh, Seriously. All right, we did something tonight, David. Is that it? Do we have time for some questions? Yeah, looks like, looks like so. we've got 20 minutes, so. All right, we've got time for, for, Bring it, for, folks. for questions. Thank you. Now, you're, you're going to have to do your bit. You're going to have to walk all the way down to that microphone. Please announce your pronouns uh, before uh, you submit the question. Okay. okay. Uh, 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 as we said and earlier. And wear a mask. Right. Wear a mask. right, right. <laughs> so, uh, Jeremy Polly from Las Vegas. Okay. Now, I, I our, understand. Our, so, so, I want, so, I, so, I want to uh, uh, just you know, uh, see, see, you know, uh, <coughs> Acknowledge that everything that implies of, of teaching Bible in uh, in public school, like in Iran, when the Jewish when the Jewish students are, when the Muslims are studying the Quran, the Jewish uh, boys have recess. Okay, so if there's Bible taught in public school, and part of the Bible says that those who don't follow the Bible are are condemned, and then the Jewish boys are out playing, you know, playing soccer, and then they come back, and they're uh, recognized as the boys who don't, you know, who don't who are uh, condemned according to the Bible, and 
that would seem rather uh, uncomfortable and, you know, and uh, for that matter, who's, what kind of teachers are qualified to teach the Bible in public yes, school? Yes. Let me take several questions. Okay, yeah, all right, uh, thank you. Let, let, let's, let's take two or three more questions, please. Hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, Francis Lee, uh, service warfare officer in the U.S. Navy. Um, so my question is regarding the Constitution, and uh, Douglas Murray, you're free to answer it as well. Uh, <laughs> yes. But so my question is, uh, first, uh, when the, uh, we fought during World War II, we knew why we were fighting and what we were defending. And again, when we fought against the Soviet Union uh, in the version of a Cold War, we knew what we were defending, uh, especially those in the military. But now in the um, polity, uh, I say one party in particular, the Democratic Party, um, views uh, the Constitution as um, an old document. Uh, they try to uh, pack the Supreme Court, um, even label trigger warnings on the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence itself in the National Archives. So my question is, so it seems like when we say that to serve and defend the Constitution, whether for government officials or military service members, um, that we are merely now in our present moment defending unfettered individual autonomy um, just and, and the modern, postmodern liberal project. And so is that understanding that I've come to accurate? Um, and if so, is it worth defending? Is it worth people going and dying for? Uh, so that's my question. Good question. Thank you. Why don't we do four? We'll do them somewhat brief, and then we'll all give brief answers so we can get to as many as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Micah Veillon. I'm a history and philosophy student at Georgia Tech. Um, so I was wondering, in his book, How to Be a Conservative, Roger Scruton tackles a little bit of this problem when he talks uh, his essay on uh, the truth of, of liberalism. And he basically says that, you know, we don't want to live in a theocracy where, you know, I can be a Christian here in the United States or a Christian in Switzerland, but I can't enjoy uh, Anglo-American rights in Switzerland like I can here in the United States. And he talks about how the law is stitched to the land and the land to the law. So do we, can we have things like, like liberalism and like secular law and, and uh, natural rights, but ha do we have to also realize that things like natural rights and human rights really don't exist? It is kind of nonsense on stilts if we don't see the, the, where they lie and what they rest on, which would be our Anglo-American political institutions and the Judeo-Christian ethic. You know, like in the French Revolution, they tried to, you know, give everybody universal human rights, but they actually stripped the French citizens of the only rights they enjoyed, which were French rights. So do we have to understand that we can have these things, but that we cannot, in a way, if we detach them from our traditions that we're basically cutting the branch off of the tree and the branch can't live when it's off the tree. My name is Bob Gazzardi. I'm from West Palm Beach. Uh, you are asking a good question. Why do they not want to be part of us? And one of the issues that you have not discussed is abortion and also gun rights, the Second Amendment. And I was wondering, Perhaps if I could ask Dave to talk about the first, the issue of abortion, because he has talked about it on his great radio show, and we're, we wish you all kinds of success with Rumble. Um, talk about that, and also talk about, if Douglas wouldn't mind, talk about how he views the American Second Amendment, which I consider one of the great glories of our Constitution. Do you want to handle the first question about the carve out? In, in a place like Iran, do you want to handle that? You'll do the second one? The yeah. Okay, go ahead. Well, if you want to handle the first one first. I don't remember the first. The, the first was the carve out in a place like Iran. You know, if you're going to send the, the Jewish boys out to play okay. soccer while yeah, they yeah, might okay, be learning right, right. some things in, in a theocratic nation. Look, the problem with, a problem with the way that this discussion is conducted is that each side, every side, can paint a nightmare picture of the worst things that the other side always did. Okay, so it's the easiest thing in the world to do is to say, um, you know, you Christians and Jews, you're just going to be like Iran, and and we can say back, you know, you 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 you, you, you liberals, uh, without God, you're going to be Stalin and Pol Pot. 
right? We, 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 can, we can act like that. But I don't think that this approach is dealing with the actual human beings who actually populate places like America and Britain. Okay, there is a tiny minority that, you know, always on the fringes who, who, who can be very scary and if they got to power then they would do terrible things. But my view, and, I'm, and I think my view is, is actually special view because, because, of the fact, because of the fact that I'm Jewish. I know that Jews have had very good reasons to be hostile to Christian rule for a long time. Right? I, 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 I know that. If it were 200 years ago, then it would be very possible that I would be looking at you know, the examples of, of, uh, uh, of Christian government, and I'd say, you, you know, let's, let, let's give what the liberals are offering a try. Maybe. I, I don't know. I've never been a liberal, so it's hard for me to imagine that. But, <laughs> but, but maybe. All right? Maybe it's possible that that's possibly true. Here we are in a different place. All right, and, and the, uh, uh, today, the strident hostility to Torah, to Bible, to the keeping of mitzvot, to, of, of, of the commandments, for, for a Jew in many countries today to, uh, to, to get kosher meat or to circumcise his or her son is illegal in many democratic countries. And we have to recognize that what is coming is a, uh, a secular leftist persecution of Jews and Christians. I'm not saying it's going to happen everywhere. I'm not saying every liberal is going to do it. But it is happening. And at this time, there is no force to stop it. It's happening and it's advancing. And I think that any Jew who looks at what is, looks objectively at the map and talks to Christian leadership and talks to Christian scholars and talks to Christian young people will come to the conclusion that the Christians in general, not all of them, but as a general matter, many of the Christians, the serious Christians, are more pro-Jewish and more, pro, more supportive of, the, of, of Jews being able to, 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 to live freely and pursue our traditions and our, and our way to God than many of the secular, the liberals, and the Marxists. And in that circumstance, it doesn't help me to, to, to rehearse all of the, the worst things that Christians ever did in history. I have to deal with the here and now. And the here and now is that many of the Christians are the Jews' best friends, and that we need to find a way to allow them to be Christian in return. I'm going to tackle the question about um, what it means to fight for the United States and what it means to fight for the Constitution. I'll start by saying this, that I'm here, I'm an immigrant from Iran, and I'm here at the National Conservatism Conference because I deeply, deeply care about the fate of the United States. There is no other place. I'm like the protagonist in Michel Welbeck's Soumission, where he says, uh, you know, uh, the, I, his girlfriend, as, as Islamists take over France, his girlfriend's like, well, I'm making Aliyah to Israel. And he says, oh, I don't have an Israel. This is it for me. So this is it for me. I, I, I care about the United States a great deal. Um, and so it saddens me um, to compare, you said, the FDR's messages about why we, we were fighting in World War II. Not only is say we fight for the Constitution. If you go back to a lot of the, the wartime fire chai, fireside chats and other speeches, he says, we are defending our Christianity in World War II, right? So that he saw the struggle against Nazi Germany and the Axis power as a struggle for uh, a, a Christian identity and a Christian worldview as against this kind of pagan monstrosity. Now, fast forward 70 years or so, and you have, it's worthwhile comparing um, ads for recruitment from, for the CIA and other intelligence agencies, the United States, and uh, other powers that are, are rivals. It's, just be honest. Right? Have you, I don't know if you've seen these ads, but the CIA released a series of ads in which it's, there's a woman, she says, you know, uh, I have anxiety disorder, I'm gender confused, and <laughs> I'm 
proud to work for the Central Intelligence Agency. <laughs> <laughs> and you think, oh yeah. my goodness, someone sitting in Beijing or Moscow is watching this. Is going like, this is, wow. Wow, that's... Yeah. <laughs> More worryingly, just, you might just... be in charge of a drone. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I say that, but that's, that's the product of, of 60, 70 years during which uh, our, our kind of ideology has been that you, all you need to do is self-actualize and so maximize your own autonomy. It's all about you as an individual. Uh, it, it, it's, it's no crime to say, I, it shouldn't be a crime to say that the Chinese are a more serious power as compared to that. The Russians are a more serious power. They have, if you compare Russian ads or the Chinese ads that recruit for their military, the PLA ads are like, I have to be hard because what's behind me is soft. And what's behind me are women and children, are Chinese women and children. I, the PLA soldier, has to be hard. That's a, that's a coherent account of what the nation state is for. What are we fighting for? I mean, that, and again, what, and what would it mean to switch the narrative that we've been stuck in? Go ahead. Can I say, I, we have to be very careful on the conservative side with these. Russia is playing us on this stuff. It is so keen to play up the sort of weak transgender CIA versus the tough Russian soldiers. Russia is a corrupted society through and through. I mean, its military could not do what it pretends it can do. Sure, but we shouldn't be complacent. Very, we shouldn't be it's, complacent. It's, I just say because across Europe and increasingly in America, there is a form of conservative sort of admiration as if they are this thing. This is a kleptocratic society uh, run by a hideous regime that knows how to play part of the West now. China, that's a, that's a different matter that could be serious. Very quickly, the gentleman asked about the Second Amendment. I think that people with my accent talking about the Second Amendment is... Uh, yeah. Generally, <laughs> it's worse than most people talking about trans. <laughs> uh, I, I, my view is that one of the great interesting things about conservatism is that conservatism is, conservatism is different in different places. We're all conserving different things. I sometimes point out that the Second Amendment is akin to the royal family in my own country. Uh, the royal family kill fewer people uh, than uh, the Second Amendment arguably does by proxy, but uh, it's similar in that we find ourselves with this. <laughs> um, were you starting today, you might arrange things differently. But we're not starting today, and no society should ever attempt to. The Second Amendment is an incredibly important part of the American Constitution, the American civilization. I understand that many outsiders find it bizarre. I was once on a panel with Sorab's friend, David French, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, David referred in passing to the fact that there had just been a shooting in a church somewhere in America, and David said, uh, if this were happening in my church, you know, it wouldn't have been possible the shooter could have got away. Cause I, and I said, well, why? And he said, well, at least 60% of us guys in church are packing guns. And I just thought, why the hell do you go to the Eucharist with a gun? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seemed insane to me. But, you know, it's part of the American settlement. And, there are and so many David French jokes just coming to him. <laughs> taking a Herculean so, effort. So not little to. time. Um, but, but, but it is a bit like the royal family. You know, you, the, these are settlements we have. I just would say one thing quickly. Sorry, because I know we, we've got to take more questions and Dave's got to speak. But... I think it is difficult in America for many leftists when they perceive the right is interested only in a couple of totemic issues. I find the abortion issue is very moving to me. I'm very moved by the fact that Americans consider this to be a deep social and moral issue, because it is. And in other Western societies, it's talked of too frivolously. I admire Americans for taking it seriously. I admire Americans for taking their own self-defense seriously. Nevertheless, the conservative movement that comes to power, that comes to governance, has to be wider than that. That's all I can say. 
so for brevity's sake, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. So I think the third question we sort of have answered in a way. So I'll quickly hit the abortion thing in 30 seconds, and then we'll do a few more, try to just keep it brief, and we'll, we'll be as brief as possible. Look, I, I struggle with this one probably more than anything else. It was the hardest chapter in my book for me to write. It's the one that I got more pushback than anything else. Um, I do consider myself begrudgingly pro-choice, at least for a few weeks. I think you have to have some flexibility there. We can talk about all sorts of medical issues for the woman or for the fetus. Um, but because I said we were going to be brief, I'll, I'll sort of leave it at that. But it is one where if this alliance is to come together, uh, when, when Douglas says, well, what can we do to make them more OK? I have no illusions that I would ever sit up here and try to convince anyone that is pro-life to be pro-choice. And as I said, I, I struggle with it, and, and especially because the left has gone so off the deep end with abortions, where they now talk about eight-month abortions and quite literally post-birth abortions, post-birth abortions. Um, it's, it's making my, my quandary on this even more difficult, because I realize if you give them an inch, they're going to take much more of that. So I would, I would sort of leave it at that. But if I see you in the hallway, I, I'd be happy to talk about it more. Let's, let's try to keep them quick. I was a bit surprised by the consensus among the panelists on bringing back uh, prayer and religious uh, courses into the school, because I think that's going to make it very difficult to argue against the teaching of critical race theory. Now, um, one could try to cut a variety of distinctions between CRT and the Bible, but Joran did repeatedly refer to the majority, and there's no question that in some areas a majority would not want the Bible taught and uh, would want things taught that you would never want taught. So I can't imagine that we're actually going to vote on this uh, school district by school district on what type of ideology or religion is going to be taught. Um, so I just wonder if you'd reconsider that. Uh, I wanted to make another comment about the repeated references to Jews as if they are the kind of cutting edge against uh, Christian majoritarianism, particularly in education. There's a whole line of Supreme Court cases in which the Jehovah's Witnesses are the primary party, and they're, of course, Christians, the Flag Salute case and many others. They're really the most significant group in this context. And um, I, I could go on, but I, I think it's, a, uh, although the conference has been very sympathetic to Jewish traditions in many ways, constantly referring to Jews as being at the forefront of opposition to Christian symbols and, su and stuff, I just don't think ca kind of captures the spirit of the constitutional law. I'll be very quick in responding to the comparison between CRT and the Bible, and I'll respond with the famous drill meme that the wise man stroked his chin and solemnly said, there is no difference between good and bad things. Ken Chesbrough, an attorney from New York City. Uh, to follow up on the David French theme, um, what can, <laughs> now this, is, uh, I mean, this really troubles me. What can be done to unite the right to push back against the leftists, even if, as seems entirely possible, Donald Trump is the Republican nominee in 2024? That is, how do you bring in the establishment Republicans and never-Trumpers to conclude that Donald Trump is the lesser evil compared to the leftists? <laughs> Uh, good evening, and first of all, really thank you for opening up this, um, I think, very profound and important internal conversation among uh, conservatives. And my, my question is provoked by Douglas, but it's really for the entire panel, perhaps uh, most um, pressingly for Yoram and Sorab. And the question is as follows. D Douglas mentioned the distinction between gay marriage on the one hand and the trans issue on the other, meaning we don't want to be educated in terms of language, boys and girls and so on, but it's okay to be educated in terms of what we define as marriage. Marriage being not just man and woman, but marriage is rather any two people um, at the moment. And then the question is, well, of course, where do you draw the line? Meaning it's okay to redefine marriage, but it's not okay to redefine sex and gender. But this isn't an attack on Douglas. It's a question really for your You can try. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. And, and that, that's where I'm going. The, the question is as follows. Society changes due to technological advances, due to social changes. 
This is true, of course, concerning contraception, which has redefined not just sexual intercourse, but marriage. Marriage looks different because of contraception, and I think the vast majority of people here are not against that. Um, the same is true of a whole range of, of changes. Uh, women get the vote. Maybe conservatives were against that once upon a time, but I think the vast majority of conservatives today are not against women having the vote. And the same is true for a whole... Pl okay. Sorry, Yoram, I don't know if that's uh, <laughs> reflective. But the same is true of a whole plethora of additional issues. I mean, it was Edmund Burke who said that in order to preserve, in order to conserve, you do have to improve, and, and things do change, and things do improve. And then the question is, well, how do you define, how do you decide? I mean, again, if you're an Orthodox Jew, then you have a halachic system, a system of Jewish law, and those are your boundaries. Well, you're a lucky man. You have those boundaries, and you can sit in your insular community and enjoy them. But over here, we're not speaking about insular little communities. And I think Yoram, to speak about majority of states, I don't know if that's quite good enough either. That's not really what we're speaking about. We're speaking about the soul of America, the soul of humanity of, of, of what it is to, to be a citizen of the United States or indeed other countries in the world. And question maybe, mark. Maybe question mark. There's yeah. got to be a question mark. And my question is... <laughs> no, you've already done it. Sorry. You've already done several questions. We've got to have more. Well, let, yes. let me... Let me put, put, we can't keep having a run. One sentence. One sentence. One sentence. My question is, why do we need an alliance? At the end of the day, we're a democracy. In got terms it, of it. a democracy, we will go with got a general it, it, consensus. It. Let's try to persuade the public in what we believe, and that will be our alliance. All right, got it. Um, all right, well, I think one more, and then we, we are out of time, right? So, okay, so last one, and then we'll, we'll try to answer all these. Hi, um, I'm, Jen I'm from IRA, from um, Israel. My question is, I've noticed a bit over this conference that, um, and I know this is going to be a very unpopular opinion, that we've kind of taken on a tendency of the left, which is they dissed everything that they disagree with us, and we as the right have kind of gotten very comfortable saying, oh, the left are just so stupid and ridiculous. Um, and as a student on campus who's dealing often with, I don't know if I would say the most intelligent human beings in the world, but definitely a level of left intelligence, do you have any advice um, instead of just immediately dissing as just this group that don't know anything about anything, um, we, we have to have conversations with them as a right. So what do you have any advice for a student in that kind of situation? Can I hit that one and then we'll go backwards? Is that, is that all right? I would say on that one, you know, I, I completely agree. We can't just sit here and say that these things are all ridiculous and we may think that they're ridiculous and that critical race theory doesn't make any sense and that they, you know, use double speak and all of these things. But I, I often reference on the show uh, the original 1979 alien. And if you remember the doctor, as the alien was rampaging through the, the ship, killing everybody, the doctor admired the alien. And he was explaining why he admired the alien. It was remor remorseless. It had no morals. It did what it wanted, no matter what. And in many ways, that's what the left is doing. So you have to give the devil his due. If this thing is so idiotic and so moronic, and yet has wrought such destruction, then what does that say about us that we couldn't stop it, right? So you can't be so dismissive to the point that, oh, well, it's nothing. Well, meanwhile, look at where we're at, right? I mean, what's the purpose of this conference? I would say the best thing you can do probably in college is you really have to address some basic truths. You know, one in the last two weeks was when we took the, the trans woman, Rachel Levine, is now our first four-star general something, something. Admiral. Admiral. Please, yeah. don't other her. They said, yeah. they, said the first openly, they said the first openly transgender admiral. Right, right? openly. As if, as if there were many hidden ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but the way it was framed, I mean, if you, the New York Times tweet about it and headlines said first female. Female, not first openly trans. They, they worded it both ways, but it said female in there. 
And on my show, I Googled the word female in the stupidest thing I've ever have to, had to do. I Googled the word female. I mean, in essence, you've got ovaries. And Rachel Levine does not have ovaries. So they have butchered language. Uh, our, our attorney general, uh, uh, sorry, our surgeon general also said first female. So again, you have, to, you have to admire the way that they have wrought so much destruction. But I think an instance like that, that's where you should go to your friend who is, let's say, a, you know, a sophomore or junior in college who's a lefty and a feminist and the whole thing, and really try to sit her down and say, do you realize as a feminist, as someone that wants equality for women, that now the first four-star admiral, did you say? It was at, well, yeah, the first four-star admiral is biologically a male, and that is a product of progressive feminism. And do you think that is right? And if you can, and look, none of these things are easy because they'll come back at you, they'll scream at you, you hate trans people, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if you can really get one that, that personalizes it to them, you know, the, the female swimmer at college who loses to a male swimmer, where we've all seen the pictures of the wrestlers, the trans wrestlers, like these things that, that are so profoundly obvious, uh, sometimes that might kind of do it. I'm going to preemptively petition YouTube to ban this video so that we, can, we don't have to worry about it. I'm joking. Oh, they're coming either way. Don't worry about that. Well, there was a drone in here. Come on. Okay. Uh, Dave, let me, let, let me, let, I just want to continue on, the, on, on Mayor's question about uh, uh, the left is so stupid and the left is so, uh, uh, so foolish. Um, if anything, I've said gave that impression, uh, I've misspoken. Uh, I, I, you know, I can't speak for everyone at the conference, but my own view is that uh, the, left has, the left is extremely intelligent. It's extremely clever. And I, I don't mean that in a, in necessarily in a devious way either. I, I mean that for uh, 150 years, um, Marxists and the descendants of Marxists have been uh, elaborating and repairing and fixing and, and, and fixing up and making sharper and, uh, a set of theories which continually grows and becomes more effective. And these are intelligent people. I mean, when, when I was in gradu graduate school, I, you know, in the Stone Age, I, the, I spent uh, a semester Sitting in a uh, in a class with a with a with a devoted Marxist professor, and we learned Marx. We studied nothing but but uh, Mar Marx and Engels. But he brought in you know later Marxists. The entire class, other than me, were basically Marxist sympathizers. And the during during the breaks in the seminars, they'd make announcements you know for the Marxist rallies and what they were going to you know destroy uh, that week. And um, <laughs> Look, I, I can't take any way f anything from them in terms of into, in intellectual probity, diligence, uh, um, uh, d devotion to trying to understand the subject matter. The, I, I, I don't think that this can be said often enough. Uh, there, there are, you know, of course, there, 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 there are all sorts of fakes and frauds in academia, but they're not all Marxists. I mean, a, a, academia makes it easy for all sorts of people to be fakes and frauds. But, but, but among Marxist professors, you know, many of the, of, of, of the sharpest, most incisive people that I've known in academia are, are, are progressives and Marxists, in, including friends. And, uh, you know, God forbid that we should underestimate their uh, their worth as uh, scholars and thinkers and philosophers. That, that, at least for me, that's not my intention at all. My intention is that reason, reason used well, can come to all sorts of things. Right? And I, I know there are people in the audience who don't necessarily agree with me, but the, 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 this is my view, and I, I also think it's a traditional Jewish view. Intelligent people can come to all sorts of terrible things. And the thing that prevents us from coming to all sorts of terrible things is a common sense which is part of our traditional inheritance. And what we've settled on is, uh, is uh, because it's, it's almost illegitimate to say, 
you know, our national tradition or our religious tradition says this, so let's just leave it this way because, you know, we don't know what's going to happen if we change it, or let's change it only a little bit and see what happens. Because that entire conservative way of thinking has become illegitimate and out of bounds, and everybody has to frame everything in terms of reason and rights. So you, you, you end up with people saying, Oh, you know, my opponents, wow, their, rights, their, their ideas are so stupid, they're so foolish, they're so, you know, their reason is misfunctioning. There's nothing wrong with their reasoning. They just see from a different perspective. And it happens that if we let their perspective win, it'll destroy us. Now, maybe you don't see it that way, but that, that's what I'm seeing. I'm not saying that they're not smart. I'm just saying that they're leading us off a cliff. They're very smart. They're smart, but they're stupid. All right, no, I, this is a famous Irving Crystal line that I'm referring to. They're, they're not stupid in that, that they're thinking badly, they're, but they can't see the cliff. So those of us who can see the cliff, I, I don't think we should be saying that, 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 that our rivals and our opponents are stupid. I think that we simply need to say that there's a cliff in front of us. There is a cliff in front of us. That's why we're all here tonight. I'm gonna tackle the stupid left question and then the other one that was a really long question and try to forge my own answer um, through, the, through the maze. Um, on, the, on the stupid question, I, I would go even uh, further than Yoram and say that there are Marxist insights that conservatives need to take seriously. And the chief one is the idea that there is a tension between you being a conservative and you, you cherish certain traditional forms of life and so forth, and you at the same time being a, a kind of unapologetic free marketeer. Marx and Engels correctly say that the market in many ways demolishes traditional forms of life and it, because it reduces every kind of social relation to a monetary transaction. But I take that seriously. You don't have to become a Marxist to take that idea seriously. But it's worthwhile for traditionalists to, to read Marx and to um, ponder that, that intersection of the cultural phenomena that they decry and the economic and material base that makes those phenomena come to life. Um, the other question about, I don't know, it was very hard, but I will try to give an answer to the question I would have preferred to have been asked, which is, we cannot agree about the good because we live in a, just an, a hopelessly pluralistic society, so every attempt to say that there is a good is just an, a terrible imposition and a grave crime. And I would just say, there, there is a, a wonderful, to go back to Leo Strauss, I'm not a Straussian, but there's a wonderful insight in the early chapters of, of natural right in history where Leo Strauss says, in effect, just because there are many opinions about right and about the good doesn't mean that one of them isn't right. So, um, to, we, and I think we have to be comfortable with that. So that, and there, there, again, you cannot forestall the decision about saying, okay, this is the good in a society forever. And our, certainly our progressive friends aren't stopping at all and they're not shy about it and I think we shouldn't be. Let me take, I think, probably the last round we've got, isn't it? So let me take none of the peripheral questions, as it were, not to insult any of the questioners, but let me take on two big, big issues. First, Donald Trump, and perhaps secondly, I could talk about the meaning of life. <laughs> In that order. Let me say what I think the problem is with Trump as an observer. The problem is that whenever you get conservatives on a stage, they pretend to know less than they know about Donald Trump. And that's a very uncomfortable position to be in. People have to pretend not to know things about him that they know. Uh, I myself think this is ridiculous. Uh, I think there is a perfectly good, reasonable defense of Donald Trump. Um, I don't hear it very often, uh, but I hear the avoidance of, I think, unavoidable issues all the time. Um, I think there is much to be said for his presidency and much to be said about the damage he's done both to this nation, to its reputation, and to its civic politics. Um, I wish that we were able to have a discussion about a figure like him that took all of that in the round. 
Um, for instance, I have a friend who's served in a number of administrations who said to me once, the problem is, Douglas, I'm trying to bring up a son and all of the things I'm trying to teach him are things the president breaks daily, just in terms of behavior, of manners, of morals. I believe that outside of the law, as a famous jurisprudence expert in Britain in the early 19th century said, outside of the realm of the law, we're in the realm of manners. Now, in the realm of manners, Trump has made things in this country very hard for a lot of people, and a lot of conservatives, for obvious reasons, have to pretend that's not the case. But it's complex. Just like, you know, I said in a discussion with Jordan Peterson after January the 6th, I said, look, I mean, this country has a serious problem with ele its electoral process. And I think it's lamentable that the world's leading democracy that sends uh, election observers to Ukraine uh, can't have election observers in its own states right. who know what they're doing. I think this is an unsustainable and ridiculous position for this country and this republic to be in. But equally, it seems to me, if you went back even five years, you would have to say it's a ridiculous position to think that there's only one man in the entire republic who is telling the truth, and that man is Donald J. Trump. Five years ago, at any gathering, we said that's a ridiculous proposition. Mike Pence is lying. All these other people are lying. Only Donald Trump holds the truth. The, the, I think we have to be able to have out the Donald Trump stuff much better. And I hate seeing the way in which he's effectively got a grip on some great candidates. And my gosh, the Republicans have got a great bench and the Democrats do not. But he has a grip on them, which I wish, I wish we could just have it out more. Now, the meaning of life. <laughs> Let me be serious about this for a moment. My own view is that conservatives have to be able to offer much more than, as I say, talking about the Second Amendment, talking about abortion, telling other people how to organize their sex lives, or anything else. Uh, Saurabh's uh, terrific recent book, and other books recently have pointed out the fact that we have to have an understanding of our own tradition. Now, let me approach this this way. I happen to believe that a religious education is the best basis for an education of a civilized and, in the end, liberal person. Why do I say that? Because a civilized person needs to know where they're coming from, needs to know one tradition very well, and then go out into the world and find all the other traditions that exist as well. And if you do that in your life, you will be a civilized person and you will have lived a life that is rich. But it is exceptionally hard to do this the other way around. It is very hard to begin from somewhere that is nowhere, to not have a sense of home, both national, regional, spiritual, philosophical. It's very hard to start with none of that and then to go out into the world and to ever be at peace with the world. So my own view is that actually the religious tradition, and I'm not that specific about it, I know which ones I favor slightly more uh, than others, but what matters most is that you know where you come from. Or as T.S. Eliot says, the home is where you start from. Because as he says, the world, as we grow older, the world grows more complicated. Now it grows more complicated for everybody as they grow up, but if they've come from somewhere, they know where they can go. If they come from nowhere, they're going to be lost. And I say, just maybe I can conclude on this, that in terms of the religious and non-religious dialogue on the American right, on the right in general, there are answers to this that we already know, and there are, the left always wants to say struggle. And I say the right must say, among other things, we must find things that we can make peace with. And the religious debate, the religious debate in particular is one that we can make peace with. Uh, in one of his letters to the young poet, uh, Rilke says, this advice I often give people, he says, um, be patient with all that is unanswered in your heart. Learn to love the questions themselves. Learn to live the questions. And perhaps some distant day, you may find you live yourself into the answer. <laughs>